It's nine o'clock. So, we will get started. I guess the, uh, many of you are still taking time to <laughs> wake up after the banquet. So, uh, good morning to all of you. My name is uh, Jikit Lui. I'm currently with the Education University of, of Hong Kong. So, uh, I'm the chair for this session. I hope that you had a delightful evening yesterday indulging in the splendor, flavor, and sumptuous Japanese dinner banquet, accompanied by a mesmerizing performance. So I think it's a really, truly memorable experience that brought us together, ICC community, after a few years of lockdowns <laughs> of the COVID. So uh, today is my honor to introduce our keynote speaker for the morning. It's uh, Professor Curtis Bonk. So uh, let me say something about his accomplishments. There are many accomplishments. So I think Curtis uh, not only talk, I think he does a lot of things. So you can read about all the wonderful things, achievements he had in his short bio. I just want to mention a few things. So uh, Professor Bong is a professor in the School of Education at Indiana University, teaching psychology and technology courses He's also a junk in the School of Informatics in Indiana University. So this is new to me. He's a, form, a former software entrepreneur, certified public accountant, uh, corporate controller, and educational psychologist. Now, and is currently an educational te technology researcher, and he has won many awards. So I don't want to uh, mention all these words. You can read that. And uh, I just want to mention one or two things. So uh, yeah, he has given many talks, many keynotes, won many awards. And uh, I think in the past year, he has been a uh, co-host for the award-winning podcast show, Silver Lining for Learning. I think with colleagues like uh, Chris Didi and uh, Zhao Yong. So I mentioned that because I, I was one of the contributors to, to early the series last year. So uh, you can listen to the podcast. So, uh, so beyond Kurt's uh, very splendid achievements, there's something truly inspiring about Kurt's uh, personal commitment to health and well-being. So he shared with me that uh, he has been uh, on an extraordinary journey of regular running, regular jogging, doing it every single day. And uh, for the past, I think, 1,000 old days, and still counting. So uh, I think it's truly a testament to uh, Kurt's uh, unwavering dedication and focus on the things he's doing. So please join me to welcome Professor Curtis Bong. Thank you, Chikit. Uh, you know, we got the packet in the conference openings when we got here, and the first thing I saw was this, make the campus smart, <laughs> right? So that's the talk here. Wake up from our smarter dreams, smarter learning dreams. Time to wake up from our innovative learning dreams and make smarter learning a reality. So maybe we do that here today. Maybe we do it this morning, right? Um, so 1,000. 359 days in a row I've been running, and right through COVID. 
Um, and podcast shows started the first day I started running. March 21st of 2020, I started podcasting and running that day. And I turned it into a daily calendar for 2024, and I have a few I'm going to give away today. So it's time to wake up. <laughs> it's time for all of us to wake up. And one way in which I'm going to get us to wake up is I'm going to call this side of the room group one, and this side of the room group two. And you're all going to say, it's time to wake up when I say group one. And you're going to say, it's time to wake up when I say group two. So I'll say one, two, three, group one. One, two, three, group one. It's time to wake up. One, two, three, group two. It's time to wake up. I think group two did a lot better, and they get chocolates. So let's, <laughs> let's make sure you pass those around. I'll try and give some to each side. You'll have six attempts at this. Godiva chocolates, in fact, so we'll I'll get you all waking up eventually. I'm sorry, group one. I'm so sorry. You know, you know, you'll be smarter next time. <laughs> so smart technologies in the 1930s were to radio, correspondence courses, to get people who had polio through their you know, studies or to avoid getting polio. 1930s, that's smarter learning back then. That's how I learned. I got into grad school by taking correspondence and TV courses to get into Wisconsin at graduate school. Do I look that old? <laughs> but it saved my life. People talk about MOOCs today. Oh, there's people dropping out of MOOCs. Oh, they're terrible. There's lots of people whose lives are saved because of MOOCs. They're changing because of them. If we just document one person whose life's changed, it's, it's for the good. They're so focused on the negative side. But distance, online, open education has changed millions and millions of people's lives. That was smarter learning back then. In the 1960s, the people in Illinois, over a little bit away from Indiana, I grew up in Wisconsin, we really didn't like Illinois people. We had to drive through it, go through that flat land of Chicago. But um, Illinois people are pretty smart. They created, you know, like Netscape and things like that. And, you know, they supercomputers and the Plato Project. Plato gave us databases, online databases, and chat rooms, and email. You know, user communities, touch screens. In the 1960s, that was smarter technology. We haven't really progressed beyond that, have we? You know, if you want a good book, Brian Deere's book, The Bright Orange Glow, documents the Plato Project over decades of time. Take a look at that. And we get to the 1970s, and we got pocket calculators. That was smarter learning back then. That augmented our learning, right? We want augmentative tools. We still talk about that with ChatGPT. It's an augmentative tool. Yeah, it is. And it should be, right? And so that brings us forward into the 1970s. And we have Seymour Papert creating Lego Logo, Logo the programming language, to let kids control their own learning, have some autonomy and empowerment and other kinds of things. Constructionism, right? There's Seymour. You know, we had people coding, right? In the 1970s, 80s, 90s. Now we have maker spaces to do that. Same thing, same concept. Active and engaging kinds of learning. We all want to create active learning spaces for students to interact, collaborate, and engage in learning. Now we fast forward to today, and we're overwhelmed with all this technology jargon. You know, adaptive learning. I had a student just do a dissertation on adaptive learning. It's a good dissertation. Personalized learning. Uh, we got these learning portfolios, learning tools, learning profiles, all looking at screens. Where's the humanity in that? Where's the caring and the touch that was talked about in the opening keynote today? So smart learning, don't be so enamored with the technologies. Think about the whole human being, beings within the system, right? Was the message of the opening keynote and the, and the discussion panels after that, right? Well, it's going to keep advancing in terms of technology because we have a lot of advances in AI coming at us over and over. You know, it's AI, 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 AI. <laughs> They told me if I mentioned AI five times, times in this talk, I'd get good reviews. So I did AI, 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 AI. Everyone's here for that. Well, I'll cover AI at the beginning and then get to other things that are equally important, I think. Um, you know, AI is not just a recent phenomenon. We had handwriting recognition a quarter century ago, speech recognition 20 years ago, image recognition 10 years ago, reading comprehension five years ago, and now language understanding. We've had a series of advances been, have been made in AI that enable us to think about the possibilities of smarter learning today. 
image recognition. You know, we go back here, look at the, the detail in terms of the images created by AI over the last decade, right? Significant advances to the GPU. Processing power has advanced rapidly. You can see the difference just in a year makes in terms of the capabilities of the technology wrapped around us. You know. And then we, you can see the GPU increase. You can see haiku, poetry, the capabilities for, for haiku. Yeah, everything's changing in front of our eyes dramatically. As long as they don't keep firing the person in charge and then rehiring him the next day and then firing him the next day and then rehiring him the next day. There's a lot of confusion out there, not just in terms of who's in control, but where we, where we going, in particular with education. How can we best utilize these advances in visualization and computational power, right? Well, it's going to impact the workforce and the people in the workforce. And already Harvard has a report showing the productivity gains among consultants, uh, in, in particular among lower skilled consultants than the higher skilled ones, uh, productivity gains. And there's a worry about job losses, in particular those in the knowledge sector, like you and I, what are we going to be doing in 10 years? Will it be the same? I'll tell you, I'm doing totally different things from five years ago, partly because of COVID, partly because students don't want to come on campus anymore. So many reasons, my, my job and probably your job has changed as well. But that has repercussions for the little kids. At Indiana University, we have several AI grants for kindergarten, grade one, two, three teachers and students, training them about what AI is to get them prepared for this new age of learning, smarter learning environments, right? And kids and teachers in a recent survey from what, August, said, yeah, we're utilizing it. A large percent, 62%, and teachers are using it for research, for lesson plans, for um, summarizing information, generating class tests and class materials, and students say it helps them understand the material better. 73% helps them study faster, right? And if you're, in AI, if you're in higher ed, like I am, like my friend John here is, you'll know we're hit over the head every single day. We open up an email. It's about how we can use AI or take advantage of it in our classes, how we have to start thinking about it, how we have strategic plans for it, you know? So you know, every day there's these articles, and there are, every university in the US is trying to hire 60 AI experts, and there aren't that many to go around, but they all have new initiatives to hire the best and the brightest AI people, you know, all these strategic hires. There's one student at Harvard, she said to her professors, how about I use ChatGPT for one of my assignments for the final? And they, all the professors said yes. And she did pretty good. She got an A minus on microeconomics and macroeconomics, Latin po American politics, a B minus, American, well, we don't care about American presidency, do we? Um, not now, anyhow. Conflict resolution in A, intermediate Spanish in B, and so forth and so forth. Expository writing, not so good. But it did all these freshman courses. If, it, if Chat GPT can pass freshman year at Harvard, what are we going to be doing in the future in terms of teaching these young kids introductory sociology and psychology and other things, right? But there's a controversy. On the one hand, my friend Flower Darby says, we should rethink the possibilities of ChatGPT, the pedagogical opportunities are in front of us. An article that just came out November 13th, I highly recommend you read it. She's got great examples of pedagogy and, and she links to different professors and how they utilize it in their classes. On the other hand, professor says, ChatGPT is about as exciting as a Twinkie, <laughs> you know? And then we've got a special issue of the Chronicle of Higher Ed in the US. On the one hand, don't believe the hype. On the other hand, AI can enhance the pleasures of learning. Oh, I like that idea, you know? There's, people are debating this just like the debated MOOCs, just like the debated blended learning, just like the debated e-learning before that. We go through this cycle, awareness, then resistance, then understanding, and then doing something with technology, and then sharing it, and then advocacy. But we're stuck here in this understanding and resistance side, awareness, understanding, resistance. If you want to know about the possibilities of AI in higher education, go to a blog 
uh, from my friend Ray Schroeder at the University of Illinois. Again, Illinois is doing a lot. University of Illinois at Springfield. He keeps trying to retire, but they don't let him. They, they create a statue of him. He writes for Inside Higher Ed, which is free, if you can, can subscribe to it. He talks about how we can use ChatGPT for assessment and feedback, virtual study groups, language learning, personalized learning, and all sorts of things. His, he reads everything, and he summarizes it all. He's won awards for his blog. But if you want to read other things, you can check out the U.S. Department of Ed's report on AI. And by the way, all my notes are posted at trainingshare.com. One word, trainingshare. And my talk on Monday on how to publish and write is also up there, the G3 of writing talk. So if you want to get understanding the definition, what is AI, and some examples, that report's available to you. There's tons of reports. Or you can go to UNESCO's report, Guidance for Generative AI in Education and Research. And then they talk at UNESCO about different ways to utilize uh, generative AI to be a coach, to be a collaboration coach, a Socratic opponent, a guide on the side, a tutor, and other brainstorming possibility engine, right? You can also just go to different portals that are now emerging with AI tools for teachers, like this one. People who are indexing, creating these uh, online websites that you can, can help you find the tools that you need rather than looking them up one by one. And then you can go to my friends and in Canada. There's a lot going on in Canada. I tell you, Illinois, Canada, send a lot because it's such a big country. They've been doing distance learning well for decades. And uh, Contact North in Ontario is trying to help people, the indigenous people in the northern parts of Ontario. They're expanding now. They want to have you all sign up. They have a free newsletter. I highly recommend. They, in, they showcase different books, podcasts, and they have free webinars on how to teach online and how to use ChatGPT. I did one for them last Monday on online pedagogy. You can get my talk. I have dozens of examples how to use ChatGPT in, your, in college instruction. Um, that was last Monday. I'm going to give another talk for them, I think, February 8th at 10 a.m. Eastern, which would be around 10, at, it would be later at night, but it'll, it'll be recorded. For, for everyone. So um, they've now built two tools, a chat, um, uh, AI teacher and an AI tutor. So you can take a look at that. They're in, they are in beta format. So, uh, and um, Contact North has a, a lot of free reports as well. One tool I like besides chat GPT is chat PDF. I can put my article, recent article that I published summarizing my research on self-directed learning, and say, what's the, what are the themes of this article? What are five questions I can ask my student? And it, it's for free, under 100 pages. I've recently used it to generate questions on a dissertation to ask of the student who is graduating. I thought that was kind of fun. Chat PDF. Another tool you might take a look at is HeyPy. Um, HeyPy is kind of a personal counselor, just a chat buddy, a conversational partner, if you will, just to ask different questions to, to um, have a chance to reflect on life and think about your next steps and your next moves and where you're going. So especially good for people who are suffering from psychosocial emotional burnout. So there's an article in Reuters a month ago, not even a month ago. And what does it say? Exclusive! It's exclusive! Oh! OpenAI explores how ChatGPT can get into classrooms. Duh, duh, yes. Like it's some new phenomenon, yes. It's like it's just been discovered by Reuters. It, it can help schools, kids, yeah. So it's time to wake up. Group one, one, two, three. It's time to wake up. Group two, one. Two, three, it's time to wake up. Sorry, group one. You, you guys lost again. Uh, yeah, here you go. Hand some out to your friends. We'll go in the back here. Here you go. OK. We've got 30 ways that learning's changing in front of our eyes. I've tried to catalog these. I wrote an article for folks in New Zealand a few years ago. It's free online. You can go to my, my um, website, publicationshare.com, and get this article on 30 ways learning's changing. One word, publication share. You have to believe in the power of sharing, or we're not going to make any advances, right? 
So I talk about 10 ways to engage learners, 10 ways to increase access for learning, 10 ways to customize or personalize that learning environment. So let's go and take a, a dive into each of these. So the first 10, learning is more social, more hands-on, more mobile, more visual, more game-based, immersive, collaborative, and so forth. But post-COVID, there's trauma. People are not engaged, they're sleeping. They're not coming to class, or they don't want to anyhow. They've seen a different world during COVID times and don't want to go back to the way it was before, right? And we need to get learning environment engineers, right? My friend Niels Floor created something he's called a, a learning experience designer. We've had a couple of shows in Silver Lining about this, um, about learning experience designers, show 139 and 158. So if you want to listen in, about the possibilities, um, you can go to my website, silverliningforlearning.org, and take a listen. Um, we've got it available in iTunes now and many, many podcast formats. It's also in YouTube, so you can get it in various ways. Learning is more social. My students are using Padlet here just to socialize and talk about their interests and you know, what they expect to learn from the class. This is this semester's students, I think, yeah. Learning is more collaborative. These young ladies from Afghanistan escaped Kabul, went to Bangladesh, to the Asian University for Women, and wrote a collaborative book together on their experiences and about what schools could be like, the future of schools. I, I did a Wikibooks projects for many years, working with students in China, um, in, in America, and other places, and having them collaborate in Malaysia, having them collaborate and write books together. Learning is more collaborative and global. Learning is more mobile. You know, devices are getting smaller. Everybody's show, showing me their phones and their, everything's on their phone, right? All right, not, not on the phone, not wristwatch. Um, but if you listen to some of these podcast shows it, while you run, like I do, it's an educational experience. It's professional development today you can get while you're running. And one of the better podcasts is Mark Nichols from New Zealand. He's been interviewing people all around the world who are leaders in um, educational technology, and he's indexed all of those. I think he's got more than 100 of them. But learning's more mobile. You can take it with you, right? And learning's more digitally rich. My friend He Jung An from William Patterson University has created a, in New Jersey, has created a method called Hands-On, Minds-On, Hearts-On, Social-On, a collaborative maker project for teachers, not only getting them cognitively thinking at higher levels, but emotionally engaging in one's learning and getting them caring about each other's learning in this environment. She's published on this and it's freely available articles. And then learning is also more visual, much more visual. We, learn, we can learn new words through visual representation, multimedia, right? So if you're a language instructor, you might use Microsoft Image Creator, the Dolly. For example, if a teacher would like an image to use uh, in Spanish class, the prompt could be something like, create an image of a llama wearing a top tropical hat, drinking a mango juice at a beach. You could ask your students to analyze what changed between the two sets of images and infer the meaning in that suggestion. So there's, a, <laughs> there's your llama <laughs> with a tropical hat. My friend Paul Kim at Stanford has developed the Stanford Mobile Inquiry Learning Environment, the SMILE project. My son went with him to Tanzania and to Argentina and other places on the SMILE project. The SMILE project has kids and graduate students, young kids to older kids, inputting questions and trying to ask higher levels of questions according to Bloom's taxonomy, only five levels. And it has an AI, an artificial intelligence engine behind it that analyzes what level they're asking. So it's, it's competitive and collaborative in nature. It's game-based. So he's trying to increase the literacy skills of kids around the world. He's been in India working with blind children, been in Dominican Republic, been in Rwanda, Thailand, um, Mexico, working with migrant workers, you know, kids. Paul also developed the Pocket School Project where your teacher's in your pocket. Learning is also more immersive. We have a lady from Japan who's in the back row there who's doing some work with, um, you know, these metaverse space. Spaces. I saw in the poster sessions yesterday, a lot of you are into immersive learning, AR and VR, and getting people engaged in the learning process, right? And learning whether it's biology or anatomy or some other 
area. Um, this company called uh, Vis Visible Body is developing, oh, but I hit the wrong button. There. Developing a lot of different uh, animations and simulations, content for the medical field, for anatomy uh, and first year medical students and so forth. My friend, my former student, Maria Salamu in Cyprus, is getting corporate trainers involved uh, in their learning by bringing in people through holography into their training center in Cyprus at PwC. So it's time to wake up. Group two. One, two, one, two, three. It's time to wake up. OK, group one, try again. One, two, three. It's time to wake up. Finally, they're waking up. OK. <laughs> pass those back we got we got to make sure these people on the side here don't fall asleep pass them around yeah okay part two cognizant of time it's 9:25. Uh, trend number two gets that access now in America they're more focused on trend number one engagement but in parts of the global south in Western China and other places they're focused on number one access getting access improved to me this is more important you know, if I didn't have access to correspondence and television courses, I was a board accountant. I'd still be a board accountant. We need to get people access to education in many different formats and, and ways and means. So whether it's informal learning, which is spiking today, or it's video-based learning or synchronous learning or ubiquitous learning, we heard about seamless learning yesterday, right? So young people, they don't want to do what they were doing five years ago, pre-COVID. They learn. They are drinking from the, the, the well, and uh, they can learn online on their own and self-direct. Lots of people found that to be a better approach. And so I've been studying self-directed learning. I've got a new checklist on self-directed learning, 15 guidelines on self-directed learning, and a couple other things. Um, if you'd like my articles about SDL, just write me afterwards, and I'm happy to share. Uh, but you can go to Publication Share and get those as well. You know, these young people, they want to learn marketing and video production and coding and other kinds of things. And they can do it through Coursera. They can do it through Udemy. They can do it on their own, finding things, just finding things. And self-teaching, the ability to self-teach is, you know, growing. And Charles Wedemeyer at the University of Wisconsin taught, taught, had, a, had a book about backdoor learning, learning at the back door. You, you no longer have to go into the front door to learn, you know. I couldn't get into Stanford or MIT. I got a 17 on the ACT. I got, I mean, I was really dumb, you know, and, but I can learn from Stanford and Harvard and MIT today online, all this free stuff, right? And so that's how kids are learning, these young people. There's a surge, there's been a surge. Undergraduates learning fully online. 18 year olds, 19 year olds, 12 year olds, 14 year olds. I'm interviewing kids in Nepal who are teenagers learning English online first before the pandemic. During the pandemic, some of these kids in Nepal took 100 MOOCs, teenagers, and they took them, and now they're getting interviews from Princeton to go to college there. This was not possible before. It's amazing what's going on. So I've got two studies, one's published, one's in review, and I'm happy to send the article on Nepal kids self-directing their learning and so forth. Again, my podcast show, Silver Lining, has had many guests, 170 some, and one of the shows was on MIT, Stanford, and Harvard, the administrators who did reports on what happened during COVID and what they're going to do next. And the Stanford guy says, we're not going back to the way it was. We saw the light. There's the changes that are happening. We have to prepare for them, right? And so learning is more online, and there's no going back. I have, we have an online EDD doctorate program. Our face-to-face -face PhD is decreasing. The online EDD is increasing. Our online masters, huge. Face-to-face -face masters, hardly a trickle. You know, people don't want to learn that way anymore. So learning is also more global. My friend Mahabali at American University in Cairo, she's right there. I visited her class in September in Cairo. And she talked about how she's creating communities online to discuss, to engage, to socialize during her online classes. And she's built a couple that are available for all of you to join these online communities. Um, whether it's kids learning to play music with one another all around the world, 
or just talking about the changes in one's own classrooms with other professors around the world. Learning is more global. Every week in my class, I bring a guest in from around the world to talk to my students, and I record it, and I create a playlist at the end of the semester of all the guests they can learn from around the world, whose articles we're reading, whose books we're reading. Learning is more synchronous. This session is being filmed. I see the camera. Thank you, 20 people who are watching. Maybe we've got 22 now. Um, so please ask a question at the end. I'll take your questions first. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, um, you know, learning is always, there's always new possibilities with synchronous instruction, right? So here we have a conference that was held in Korea and Australia. I was a guest coming from USA. It happens all the time. It's, it's, you know, 20 years ago, it was a big deal. Today, we just, you know, yawn at stuff like this. But when we've got synchronous instruction coming from all around the world for kids in Western and Central China who don't have English instructors and are able to get English training on the fly, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Whose parents might have moved to the big cities and they were living with their grandparents in Central China. One of my students did a dissertation on this and wrote a chapter in one of my books about what's happening there. Fascinating stuff, possibilities to learn. And they've been on silver lining for learning as well. In Arizona State, it's, Arizona State's an innovator. Um, they're, they've got like all the Starbucks people getting their two year and four year degrees and so forth. Um, they're calling it the YouTubeversity. <laughs> getting a degree from watching YouTube or other videos or TED Talks or whatever. You know, so I'm creating playlists for my classes of YouTube videos of you know, prior guests in the class or my lectures. I might post a series of lectures that they can watch instead of me lecturing to them. They can watch them if they want to. Pictory. Now, Pictory is a new tool. Right before I got on the plane, someone sent me this. So I don't know a lot about Pictory, but I thought I'd throw it in there, you know. Um, in higher ed, online instructors might have lecture notes they want to change to videos. Many times it's hard to create videos by yourself and you lack time. Pictory can choose a background in, in, in uh, images and voices, female voices, different accents. Some students do not want to read articles. Instructors can turn them into audio files or videos to listen to. They can post them in both formats. Articles and audio videos are like audiobooks. Younger generations seem to like it. One of my colleagues, he Jung An again, is doing this in her classes. She's using Pictory to get students excited about their learning. Okay? So learning is more video-based. People from Africa are coming on our show, Silver Lining for Learning. We've got people from South America, from Australia, New Zealand, all around the world are coming on the show. We have folks from Antarctica, people who are studying the Adali penguin and sending their message to kids in schools around the world in curriculum. One of our guests, we've got guys who are polyglots. This guy knows 16 languages, he knows 14 languages. <laughs> they, their, their little side venture is called Language Boost, I think. And they know Bulgarian, Finn, Finnish, Serbian, Polish, Russian, Ukrainian, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish. Amazing guy. So we brought him in for a, to a session because I'm interested in online language learning. I'm doing research on YouTubers who teach languages online using ChatGPT. I'll talk about that in a second. We also brought John in. We also brought Kichit in. And I never got a chance to thank John for being my guest. He came in, it was like one in the morning in Darwin, and it was like eight in the morning for me. Uh, and John took time out to be with us, so I've got a little gift for John. Give John a round of applause. And, <laughs> and Kichit, also a round of applause for his introduction. Thank you very much. So yeah, we've had a lot of guests and it's been a lot of, it's been a lot of fun doing the show with, with my friends, Chris Didi, uh, Punya Mishra, and Young Zhao. But we've had other people as well. I'm, as I said, I'm studying the use of ChatGPT to teach languages online. And he was the first one we interviewed, Tom Galley. He's in Tokyo. He just retired as a, a, an instructor there. But if you get a chance, um, type in his name, Tom Galley, um, ChatGPT, and listen to what, how he thinks we can use ChatGPT in, for language learning. He's a very brilliant man. But we've got other people fr coming from Taiwan, from Japan, and other countries, because they're using 
you know, ChatGPT to help understand meaning in the context, correct grammar, get definitions, examples, annotate, translate, vocabulary quizzes, all sorts of things. So we've written up four papers on how to use ChatGPT for language learning. We've interviewed 22 YouTubers in this study this past summer. Two are published. They're freely available online at Publication Share. You can download. The other two are in review. Because you, use, you can use ChatGPT for conversation practice, engaging in exchanges with it, uh, vocabulary expansion, translations of words and phrases into your native language or target language you want to learn about, antonyms, synonyms, grammar and syntax, seek assistance to clarify grammar rules and sentence structures, writing practice, just to practice your writing, essay writing, creative writing, and so forth, and cultural insights about cultural norms and expectations and nuances and so forth. Learning is also more immediate today. We no longer have to wait five years for a research finding to get into books. The day in which something happens, often CNN or the BBC will have a documentary on it, you know, and they'll have images and interviews, and that all can automatically go in your lesson plans, you know. When they find, you know, 300,000 year old human skull in China and put up images and interview the scientists about what's happening, those kids, young kids can learn about that simultaneously, right? When a colossal squid was found out off the Antarctic coast and brought into port in um, Wellington, New Zealand and thawed, they put it live on Discovery Channel for kids to find out once a scientist found out. It had, you know, eyeballs the size of soccer balls, it had a translucent body, it could bring down ships with the, no, it couldn't do that. Um, but anyways, you get, when you have a 46,000 year old worm that's being thawed in the Siberian forest and is alive still? That's pretty cool stuff. You can get kids excited about science again. You want kids to get excited about science, you bring them into the current findings, right? And that's what's possible today. That's smarter learning when we're doing all this. Getting people energized, do inquiry, be curious. My friend, she may, she's agreed to be on my show. She hasn't been on Silverline yet. She won CNN Hero Award. Nelly Chabot has created a project in Kenya where kids are using open educational resources to learn about digital literacy. And they're taking classes through these OER, open education resources. In fact, in Asia, there's a portal for open educational resources that I just stumbled upon the other day. I had heard about it, but I hadn't explored it. I recommend you take a look. You know, how many, you know, 964 publishers, 4,259 journals, 37 countries. The benefits of joining, increased visibility, greater access, enhanced reputation. So go to openaccessasia.org. Life is filled with interesting ways to learn. Open education, to me, has been really, of the past century, the thing that's changed most people's lives, right? John wanted to get a picture of that, so I should let him do that. <laughs> How many have seen this website? Been to the website? Nobody. Okay. Well, no, nobody. Learning is more free and open. In California, they're spending billions of dollars on textbooks. If they can create zero cost books, that can save a whole lot of money for the community colleges and so forth. The 34 books they've developed so far, saving millions of do dollars from tuition for, for the young people today. Now, finally, after decades, faculty are becoming aware of open education resources and the advantages of, of it over print. Now, there are disadvantages, too. There's advantages of print. There's disadvantages of that. But more and more faculty are utilizing it. It might be pandemic related, but finally, it's happening. So I've tried to make my contribution to all this. And in 2011, Kamiko and I were in Manila, where this conference will be next year, and I promised the people in Manila my next book would be free. My publisher, Josie Bass Wiley, was charging people three times the price of the book. My books, they sent them to the conference, and I said, don't buy my book, I'm gonna make my next one free. I bought all the books Josie Bass sent, and I gave them away, and I promised not to have them as my, well, this is being tape recorded. Okay. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm going to go back to them. So what I did is I created a, a book with 100 activities for teaching online called Tech Variety. And every principle there, I have 10 activities for each of the 10. It's available in Chinese from the Open 
view of China. Beijing Normal translated it. So you can download it, hundreds of thousand people have. So it's my way of contributing back. It's been available since 2014, so you may say, oh, it's too old now. Well, I got a solution. Elaine Coe, my co-author, and I created a new book, a summary, a shorter book, 2022. It's available from the Commonwealth of Learning. My friend Sanjaya Mishra at the Commonwealth of Learning said, Kurt, would you like to republish this, create an updated version? So it's also free. Not only that, the Commonwealth of Learning, col.org, take a look, Commonwealth of Learning, has created a course around it. So there's a free class on how to motivate students online, a free book on how to motivate students, a second free book on how to motivate students. So I think when you wrote my, the email to me, she said, say free three times in your keynote, and people will like free, 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 right? OK? So in there, you'll see examples how to build autonomy, how to engage learners, how to create interactivity, tension linking to Piaget and to other psychologists out there, DC and Ryan and, and, and uh, intrinsic motivation. And there are a bunch of activities for flipping classroom, jigsaw, word cloud, all this stuff. It's all in there, step by step, how to do it. Now recently in March, my colleagues and I created a free book. It's really a special issue of a journal for the online learning journal about what the research says in online learning, a systematic reviews of the research. It's also free, so off my homepage you can get this. It's a quasi book. It's a journal that we put a book cover like on it. Now, all of these are available at EdTech Books. So, guys at BYU, friends of mine at Brigham Young University, create a website for EdTech Books so you no longer have to pay, your students no longer have to pay for an educational technology book. Just go to edtechbooks.org. And so, all mine have been put up in EdTech Books as well. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Yeah. So I've also worked on this big project, a book that came out in 2009 and then 2011 called The World is Open, How Web Technology is Revolutionizing Education. It was also translated to Arabic and translated to Chinese. When I travel to Singapore, everyone greets me like this. The world is open. When I travel to Bangkok, everyone greets me like this. When I come back to the Midwest, Indiana, Illinois, when I go to Taiwan, they all go like this. So what happens when I go to Japan? What do you think happens? Everyone goes like that. Lo and behold, there they are. <laughs> there they are, yeah. There they are. There they are. <laughs> Having some fun here with all of you. My friends from China and Hong Kong, out late at, on the streets, my, my workshop, yeah. And finally, I think that's the last one. It's time to wake up. Before we go to that one, could everyone help me out here? We got the cameras. I got my camera. <laughs> OK, group one. Great. Give group two another chance. We lost last time. One, two, three. It's time to wake up. Okay, group one, you heard them. Can you do better? Yeah. One, two, three. It's time to wake up. And certainly they did. <laughs> I'll put it right here in the front with your leader here and the, the head. And then we get some in the back, way back in that last row. There you go. Okay. Last one, customization. We've got 17 minutes left. Just might get through this. Learning is more customized, it's more blended. High flex. I wrote the, I edited the handbook of blended learning as you mentioned in 2006. My former student, Brian Beatty, has a high flex model he's designed. Um, learning is more modular, on demand, flipped, communal, personal, right? That's Brian. He's got a free book called High Flex Model. Now, in the US, they have Brian's picture down on the dartboard because they hate the high flex model. It's a lot of work. <laughs> but other people love the high flex model because it enabled people to learn in different ways. You can learn online, face to face, you can change every week, you can do something different. It takes a lot of planning, a lot of structuring. But kids today like the flexibility. Flexibility is a big word. In my, my class this semester is the number one word mentioned by my students. Flexibility. 
That's what they want. But they also want to self-direct their learning at times and explore, right? They want to use Duolingo, and I've been doing research on Duolingo. Two studies published this year, if you want to read about it, how, why people are, uh, get them motivated, what they're doing with Duolingo, the purpose of it, and all that. Yeah, it's AI-based as well. They want to talk to somebody, whether it's a chat bot or, or a human, right? Um, so learning is more on-demand. Learning is more self-directed. Increasingly more personal for one. You can use ChatGPT for language instruction, as was mentioned. It's more on-demand learning. If you want to learn Spanish or Japanese. Amazingly, both in Duolingo as well as our YouTuber study, Japanese was the, like the number one thing people wanted to learn. You know, Chinese as well and English, but I couldn't believe how many people said Japanese. They want to go to Japan and try it out, actually, a lot of folks we interviewed. But then we get into Salman Khan and the Khan Academy trying to personalize learning. And they're working with Arizona State to do this uh, by putting different courses up um, at a low fee, the Khan World School, learning everywhere, uh, for everyone, learning for everyone everywhere. At Arizona State, they put biology up as an adaptive course or personalized kind of course, and they increased the performance outcomes of the students at, at ASU. As you can see here, um, they improved the performance, uh, they in increased um, performance by 24%, reduced dropouts by 90%. And kids today have a choice. Do I want a human tutor when I come home from schools, or do I want to use ChatGPT? And you can see here, in general, do you believe studying with a tutor or ChatGPT is more effective? Both the students and their parents said ChatGPT. And it's particular in the science areas, math areas, and foreign language. It's better to, uh, ChatGPT is better able to know what I need, what my weaknesses are, and give me supportive feedback. And it's cheap, and they prefer it. And now you can get personalization with voice, picking actors and actresses, and maybe the emotions behind those voices. And increasingly, we're going to have that, those kinds of controls. Instead, instead, remember those tinny voices that we had 10 years ago? You know, it was good enough, but that's not what I wanted. But you can get some excited, cheerful, um, terrified, angry, whatever you want. And now we're in an age of these micro-credentials, right? These micro-credential age, where we can learn just enough to get a new degree or new job to move up in our work environment. A lot of my students are doing dissertations on micro-learning, micro-credentials, nano-degrees, and so forth. And people don't want the traditional education anymore. They want skills training. They want non-degree credentials. You can see how much is going up non-degree certificates and so forth. MOOCs. Now, this is the last data that's possible with MOOCs, because MOOCs have become um, every day, they start every day as self-directed or self-paced now. So there's no longer a data that's available to track this, but you can see how much it grew in the past decade. 220 million students a year, almost 1,000 universities. So I've got about a dozen, maybe 15 studies of MOOCs in open education, motivation, instructional design, engagement, teacher professional development, cultural sensitivity, personalization, all that. Again, publication share. My colleagues, Tom Reynolds at National U, Tom Reeves, who was a keynote at this conference back in 1998. He told me to tell everyone there. He was at Georgia, Mimi Lee from Houston, Ka Jong from Wayne. We've done three books on MOOCs and open education, one on MOOCs and open ed in the Global South. Kamiko has a chapter in this book, I believe, right, Kamiko? And the, the, the MOOCs and open ed in the Global South, they have a chapter on climate change, on how kids can work together across the world and form groups, groups, group-based MOOCs and do environmental cleanups. We also have a chapter on the Nepal kids getting English degrees from Harvard prior to the pandemic, getting the US consulate to give them certificates as well in Nepal. And then during the pandemic, this is just incredible what they're doing and learning. Um, kids were taking global health policy, English for media literacy, English for journalism, behavioral finance, social norms, you can see nanotechnologies. These are kid teenagers, kids in candy stores. They want to learn. Kids want to learn. Go figure, you know. And now Stanford's got this course that's free to learn programming. 
and tens of thousands of kids are learning to program with a whole bunch of free, te they're volunteer teachers. I think, what is the data here? 30,000 students, 120 countries, 3,000 volunteer teachers. There's no one teacher in charge. 3,000 teachers help each other teach the class. That's amazing. That was never possible. I can, you know, never heard a story like that. Democratizing education, in particular computer science. And then again, at Arizona State, they've created uh, courses in digital global finance and accounting, digital an data analytics, customer service. This is a project called the 100 Million Learner Project. Um, the donor wants to have 100 million people around the world learn for free to learn these five courses, leadership course, uh, data analytics, and then they'll expand beyond that, all right? So it's time to wake up. Group one, one, two, three. Group two, one, two, three. Uh, what do you think? I think this group back here gets it again. Yeah, it's a close one. Whoop. Who didn't get any so far? Right here, okay. Right there, okay, okay. Those are the 30 ways learning's changing in front of our eyes. I've got nine minutes left, I'm keeping track. You know, learning's more touch-based, more immersive, more global, more synchronous, more open. 10 minutes, thank you. Uh, more informal, more video, but all these. If just one thing had happened, it'd be a revolution. We got 30 things. If just e-learning happened, if just that, but there's so much more. We've, this field that you're studying, and many of your graduate students, and some of your early career professors, this has got unlimited possibilities to change people's lives, to make an impact. You all want to make an impact. Pick your, pick your topic and, and pursue it. You, the, 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 the posters yesterday were amazing. Who had a poster yesterday? Raise your hand. Had a poster two days ago. Raise your hand. All the poster sessions, raise your hands. All, everyone had a poster. Please raise your hand. Let's give them a round of applause. That was really I was just, we didn't want to go to the, the social. We just want to read the posters and talk to people, you know? So yeah, those are 30 ways it's changing, and there'll be more, but it's one way to umbrella it, one way to make sense of it, because careers are changing, the curriculum's changing. We might just watch YouTube and be YouTube-aversity, right? Or we might have fully online degrees, masters and PhDs, and other, or somewhere in between, short courses and boot camps, lots of ways to learn today. You know, I'm, I'm trained as a learning psychologist and human development psychologist. You know, it's amazing to pick at the right time to go into the field of learning, because learning is just affecting everyone all around the world on a daily, minute by minute basis, right? Minute by minute basis. And here's, you know, the learning in the third age after retirement, right? Continuing to learn, continuing to get a degree. My former student, Roby Brandon, talks about the 60 year curriculum. Chris Deedy, my podcast partner, has a book on the 60 year curriculum. We're no longer just thinking about four years, we're thinking about lifelong learning. He's got the Continuum College. He's the, the vice, chance, uh, vice provost of the Continuum College. It used to be called Outreach and Extension. Now it's called Continuum Learning. We continue to learn. Uh, Hoi Zhang's in the back there. She went to school with Rovi. You might remember Rovi uh, back in the day. He's like, she has done well. He's done extremely well. Well, I've got 10 questions for us to think about in terms of smart or learning. First question. Will teacher training programs need to be revamped to teach teachers how to adjust their strategies and approaches on a minute by minute basis because of this new data? What types of data are produced, collected, analyzed to help us make sense of the learning and inform our instructional decisions in these environments? How will questions of learner engagement change or shift as a result of learning being more immersive, massive, open, online, blended. These environments are changing. Our questions about smarter learning should change as well. What new means of automatic translation will evolve in the coming decade? We might have new types of automatic translation at our fingertips at every second on our refrigerators or on the walls of buses and or on the doors of buses and, and everywhere. Um, how can educational agents and chatbots, OER, robots, immersive worlds, effectively be embedded in society to help people who are 80, 90, 100, or, and beyond? How can we help people who are older in society continue to learn? 
What will the definition of smart be in five years? And, you know, a lot of people throw out the word smarter learning, but don't define what it is, right? right? And wh how will it change in five or 10 or 20 or 50 years? How much data is too much? Will teachers be allowed a filtering system from some of the data so they don't get overwhelmed? We don't want to, to put them in cognitive overload, right? So how are they gonna make sense of all this data and utilize it effectively? How will we know or recognize when we have arrived at a smarter stage or phase of a learning environment? What will be, each, what will be the signal that tell us that we've moved to higher levels of learning, right? Will, is machine learning, machine-centered pedagogy now being cloaked under the disguise of personalizing learning? The Bill Gates uh, syndrome, just wanting to build more technology tools, right? That can help personalize the environments for kids, but without thinking about the human side at all. And will this conference look like and be different next year in Manila when you host it, or five years, or 10 years, or 15 years? How will the field of self uh, smarter learning environments change. Are we getting smarter? Are we getting smarter? It's time to wake up. Okay. Group one. One, two, three. It's time to wake up. Group two. One, two, three. It's time to wake up. That was pretty clear as over here. <laughs> Who didn't get? This is my last two. There, she got it. Who else? It's got to be some people. Okay, way back, way back. Whoop. Behind you, behind you, behind you. Okay. So we're at a jumping off point. We're really not sure where we're going, but we know smarter learning will be happening. AI based, micro credential based, immersive worlds based, all these things will affect smarter learning environments. But we don't know what the next step will be. So I want everyone to stand up. I want everyone to stand up. Okay, on the count of three, I want all the women to jump with me on the count of three, because we're gonna figure out this out. All the women will jump with me on the count of three. One, two, three. That was a man back there. I saw you jumping, okay. Uh, okay, all the men on the count of one, two, three. All the men with gimpy legs. One, two, three. And everybody together, one, two, three. One more time. <laughs> All right, you can have a seat. So as you can see, the people at South China Normal didn't know what to do. You know, they're all sitting there watching me there. <laughs> you know, but, but you know, we have to, we're at a jumping off point. We really are. There's so much happening. There's so many possibilities to change the learning environments of our students. So I teach learning environment design. My syllabus is right off my homepage. If you want to access it, you can. Things are heating up. Things are heating up. I spent 15 years working on that Tech Variety book. That's my precious. I'm giving it to all of you. I had the idea for the book in 2000 or back in 1999. I talked about it all around the world. In 2014, it came out. 2022, the new version. That's my, my gift to everyone here and your friends. You can send it to your friends. The learning revolution is now coming within reach for all of us. But I cannot be the only one creating free books. The ed, my friends at BYU, the EdTech books, they, we need more. We need more people contributing to this free and open and massive educational world where lives are changing. We're interviewing people whose lives have changed, right? And we all should be part of that. So on the count of three, I'd like for you all to say, I cannot do this alone. One, two, three. I cannot do this alone. One, two, three, I cannot do this alone. One, two, three. I cannot do this alone. Very good. Now, who would like some Godiva chocolates? I got a whole box. It's empty, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I do have one final gift to give out here, and that is for our dear leader here. Thank you. And, and the person who's running the conference next year, I shouldn't 
give you an empty box <laughs> that has something special and for you too. So my notes are available at trainingshare.com. All my talks over the past 10, 15 years. Publications at Publication Share, free book, free book, free book, not free. <laughs> um, my most recent one um, on t transformative teaching around the world. I'm trying to think. I have I exhausted my 60 minutes. I'm right at zero, but maybe we can get one question or two. Yep. Yeah. Oh, why? Wow. A lot of questions. Go ahead, sir. I can maybe come down there with a the microphone. Uh, thank you so much for your very inspiring talk. And my question actually is a throwback, like basically returning your question to you about question eight. Have we actually become smarter? What part of the learning processes should we discard at this stage and start to think of new ways to teach? For example, like with the advent of um, large language models, uh, being able to seek information on your own, on one's own, and being able to articulate correctly is a key necessity. So should we start focusing on being pointers to knowledge rather than being um, the absolute truth, like what teachers are currently like, they have all the answers, they're great students. So what's your take on that, please? My take is the curriculum should change in terms of exploration and discovery and inquiry. At least 20% of the, the curriculum should be wrapped around students finding and sharing and indexing and comparing and co doing all sorts of critical thinking around what they found and building curriculum. We've been talking about that for a long time, and, but there are other things. We, we need to rethink how the, the activities of our students. It's not, sh shouldn't be all PBL or project or problem. Some are, are, you know, are happy with the PBL-based curriculum, but it's a combination. You know, there should be some still some instructor or tutor or mentor uh, designed, some exploration, some collaboration, some group teaming, some gr the general discussion. All those things wrap around creating a learning environment that's more active, engaging, authentic, uh, meaningful, and relevant. That's, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, <clears throat> thank you for the talk. Uh, when you say it's time to wake up, I see it as there is no excuse not to learn anymore, except maybe a lack of time or access to internet, let's say. Okay, so maybe one idea would be uh, to um, uh, uh, like reduce. So the question is, should we reduce uh, mandatory instruction or increase mandatory instruction? Because, for example, during the pandemic, there was a lot of free time, but at the same time, it increased the inequalities. So, so because, uh, yeah, yeah, so, so the, the question. Yeah. I missed the word. Should we increase what? Um, mandatory instruction. Mandatory so, instruction. Yeah, yeah. Should yeah. we increase it? Yeah, because yeah. if we have more free time, maybe people can learn by themselves. What, the what, what country are you from? <laughs> France. 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 So in France, in Italy, and Spain, if you looked at the first month in March, uh, April, April 2020, you know, they were learning things, but it was different from what they were learning in traditional schools. They were learning to play guitar. They were learning finance skills. Some were learning, you look by country, it was really interesting. In India, they were learning um, uh, entrepreneurship in in Canada, they're learning um, about the stock market. In uh, in Mexico, is speed reading. Every country, and in, in, in Italy and Spain, it was playing guitar and, and instruments because they're sitting on their patios trying to impress their neighbors. I don't know what it was, but they, they, it was self-directed. And we need not increase the mandates. We need to increase the opportunities for learning for the situations that people are in. And the situations vary all around the world what, what on a minute-by-minute minute basis with everyone. So I think to personalize learning, we have to create more flexible and open learning environments and give them more choice uh, when you can. I, I think minimum, man, minimum mandates would be me, you know, my, my, not, not increasing the mandates, minim, minimizing the mandates. Uh, my life was totally boring as heck being an accountant, and there was all sorts of mandates that I had to go through and suffer through. And I, I don't wish that on anybody. It was hell being in accounting, being an accountant. It was literal hell, and I hope, and, and those jobs don't exist anymore. You know, why do we even bother training for people with jobs that don't exist? Um, yeah. Very eye-opening lecture on the fast pace of AI and changing learning environment. When we're talking about the learning environment, it's a continuum. On one end, it's the wisdom-seeking learning, and on the other end, it's skills and competitive yeah. seeking. Yes. So this fast-paced roller coaster ride towards the technology-based learning and all, it's going to which side of the continuum? The wisdom-seeking side or the skill and competitiveness-seeking side of the business? Well, which, what's the trend? Yeah, what well, was it? Um, I would hope that has both, but ChatGPT will take over some of the skill-based. But of course, people um, need different skills. 
So it's hard to say because, as you said, all these jobs will be eliminated, but there'll be new ones that emerge in this digital space, workspace. So I, I would hope that I, on the wisdom side in the end, the lifelong learning, the pursuit of life, but you're going to still need skills till we get to that point, right? Um, so I, I, I can't answer it in a quick answer. That's a, that's a longer discussion we can have after in, in a coffee. I think we're run out of time here today. Maybe but, the right. last question. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, so thank um, you for laughing at my jokes, by the way. I yeah, saw you back there. Thank you. So I'm Wang Yin from Beijing Normal University. And actually, I am a linguistic in instructor for an adult learning. So uh, my research is about online learning engagement. So for the adults continuous study in terms of in linguistic learning, so uh, I'm using the microgenetic method to, yes. to observe their behavior. So it, from your workshop, it's like very related to my own research. So I would like to know in the further, uh, my own further study for the adult learners. So what about the smart learning, how I can observe their online engagement uh, in terms of their learning behavior? What, what factors should I focus more on? So I would like to have your advice. Thank you. Yeah, my dissertation was um, microgenetic uh, analysis yeah. oh of keystrokes in writing. It was kind of boring too. Um, <laughs> I'm just, I was, I, I, I'm a boring person maybe. But, um, you know, the retrospective analyses, filming, recording, discuss, I, I don't do enough retrospective analysis in focus groups. And I maybe would recommend you, you look at that in, in addition to the data itself. You know, to have people interpret the data and not just the researchers, the, the, the participants themselves. But we can talk after. And, and yeah, yeah. For yeah. the data analysis, that yes. part. Yes. Yeah, send thank me email. So send me email. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. So I think thank you, everyone. To... I appreciate the chance to come here to Japan, my second time here in Japan, and to be with all of you on the last day of the conference. And I'll be here all day. Um, and at the end of the day, it looks like sun is going to be out. So you maybe can see people can see a sunset actually over the lake. Um, again, thank you for, for your um, smiling at my jokes and um, hmm. send me emails after. Thank you. So, uh, Kurt, Kurt, the online audience is complaining. You don't give them a chance to shout and win some chocolates and, and, to, and to jump. Everyone online, <laughs> <laughs> count with, uh, count of three, one. Two, three, jump. <laughs> One, two, three, jump. Now, do we have a question from the online people? Uh, no, no. So okay. uh, now, now is now is our chance to give Kurt uh, his his gift. So uh, it's not him giving gifts, but uh, now it's our, our turn to give him a gift. So thank you very much, uh, Kurt, for the informative, fabulous, and mesmerizing talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.